Right. Now, as I've said every night during our study in biblical cosmology, I'm going to do something totally different than I normally do in our Bible studies on Sunday evening. I, I will not take questions or comments until the end tonight. So if you have questions or comments, jot yourself a note so you don't forget what it is. And then at the end, we'll take questions and comments over anything we've covered tonight or up to tonight from the other things we've talked about. Biblical cosmology. We're in the seventh week of an eight-week study. Tonight, we're going to look at some things about the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets. The title is Space, the Final Frontier. has nothing to do with Star Trek, but yeah. that's where our attention is going to be. Nothing that's specifically related to the earth, but the things above us in the firmament. So let's begin. <clears throat> NASA and modern science tells us that the sun is 93 million miles away and the moon is 290, uh, 239 to 245,000 miles away from the earth. And yet neither of those line up with either our senses or mathematics or the Bible. Ironically, modern science would also have us to believe that even though the sun is a whopping 400 times the size of the moon, they tell us, they say, ironically, it's also 400 times farther away than the moon. And so while our eyes and mathematics and our senses tell us that the sun and the moon are the same size, science tells us the reason they look the same size is that the sun is actually a, a burning ball of, uh, of gas that's 400 times larger than the moon. It just looks the same size because it's 400 times farther away, 93 million miles away. We've been programmed to worship at the altar of science to the point that we believe what we're told by the high priests of science without question. Perhaps it's time we begin to ask ourselves some questions about a lot of things, and we're going to do some of that tonight. <clears throat> this gentleman, Samuel Robotham, uh, wrote... Uh, the book in 1849, Zetetic Astronomy. Zetetic simply means questioning. And uh, Zetetic Astronomy, Earth not a globe. He said, the Earth is an enclosed plane centered at the North Pole and bounded along its outward edge by a wall of ice with the sun, moon, planets, and stars only about 3,000 miles above the surface of the Earth and the glass firmament at about 3,100 miles only about 100 miles away from the sun and the moon. Now, I don't have time to go back and reteach everything we've looked at over the last six weeks leading up to this, but we looked at verses out of Scripture that describe the shape of the earth from the Bible. Then we spent all of last week looking at what the Bible calls the firmament, which the Bible describes as a dome, a crystal dome over the earth centered over the North Pole, which is at the center. And the Bible says the sun, the moon, and the stars are all in the firmament. Sunspots. Sunspots are visible on water and even the tops of clouds because the sun is local and not 93 million miles away. Now you say, uh, we've been told it's 93 million miles away our whole, li our whole lives. I want you to keep in mind, first of all, if you were here for our study on the firmament, we learned a lot of things from Scripture last week and then also how science corroborates what the Scriptures say about the firmament. I want to submit to you, it's not 93 million miles away. There's nothing 93 million miles away. Everything is enclosed in the firmament. If it were truly the sun, 93 million miles away, it would not be possible for a concentrated light spot to appear as it does every day as a, a hot spot in a particular place on the earth. NASA's lie that the sun is so far away in outer space is necessary in order to sell the larger lie that space is infinite and earth is nothing special. Remember back to week number one and week number two, when we talked about the fact that science totally did away with 
5,500 years of human history and the Bible about 500 years ago when modern science began teaching that the earth was spinning and whirling around the sun and whirling through the galaxy and that earth was no place special. That's what modern science wants to do is to remove God and make earth inconsequential where there are potentially millions of other earths out there that are inconsequential too. We're just an accident in the whole big map of the stars, they say. Well, of course, that's not the truth. That's not what the Bible says. We're in a specific place. Everything in God's creation is centered around the earth because we're important to God. And after seeing and hearing what you heard out of Scripture and out of science last week about the firmament, I hope it's obvious to you that you are consequential. The earth is consequential to God. And God is not as far away as we've been led to believe. Another picture of a sunspot. The point is that if the sun was 93 million miles away, it wouldn't be making a hot spot in just one place on the earth like it is in some of these pictures. Here's another one that you can see on the water. You can even see the rays of the sun coming through the clouds. We'll say more about that in just a moment. Another hot spot of the sun on the ocean. Crepuscular rays. It's a mouthful to say. Crepuscular rays are straight lines of sunlight which shine upon the earth from the sun itself. Now, modern science would have us to believe the sun is 93 million miles away, but that not only doesn't line up with the Bible and what our eyes tell us, it doesn't line up with what mathematics tell us either. Even a 10th grade high school student in geometry knows that the angles of the rays must necessarily converge on the source of the light. Taking this into consideration, our natural senses tell us something quite different than what the masters of modern science would have us to believe about the sun, which they worship. It's, not, uh, it's local. It's not 93 million miles away. Now, we've carried this theme throughout our study on biblical cosmology. All of modern science, they're evolutionists, they're atheists, they not only don't believe in God and the Bible, they despise the God of the Bible. They are what we would call illuminists. They all, in some form or fashion, worship the sun. They are Jesuits. They are Freemasons. They are Illuminati. They belong to a number of dif different secret societies that all have in common the ancient mysteries of of Babel that came from the Tower of Babel. We taught a series a couple of years ago on Mystery Babylon and that religion that started there and then spread throughout the world when God scattered the people there at the Tower. This religion that they worship is focused on the worship of the sun and uh, not the worship of the God of the Bible. So everything to them is about the sun. But if you know even basic geometry, you know that you can take angles and use triangles and you can figure out with some basic mathematics approximate distances if you know angles of the rays themselves that are being pictured. I'll just tell you, we're about to see some calculations. I did some calculations of my own using the uh, the approximate size that they say the earth is from North Pole to South Pole. Assuming that half the earth is in darkness at one time and half the earth is in sunlight at any given time. And I came up with approximately the same distance that the sun would have to be above the earth that Samuel Robotham came up with that we heard from just a moment ago. But let's see some more of the mathematics. You understand how the rays 
create the angles so that we can calculate distances. There are some other crepuscular rays. You can very clearly see uh, if the rays are coming down at different angles, wherever they converge up there in the sky, that's where the sun is. And mathematically, it's not 93 million miles away. They can say that all they want to say that. But our eyes and mathematics tell us something totally different. There's another picture of crepuscular rays. Some more at the ocean. Some more over the water as well. Interestingly enough, if you Google the term crepuscular rays, you'll discover that modern science tries to explain this phenomenon away by saying that these rays only occur just before or just after sunset in the West. However, you can see from these pictures and some that we saw just a moment ago that sometimes there are crepuscular rays even when the sun is right overhead in the middle of the day. They don't just occur when the sun's going down or just coming up. They say that because they want to make it as though you can't really use the angles to figure out the distance to the sun. It's because they don't want anyone trying to calculate the distance to the sun because using basic geometry, you're not going to come up with 93 million miles away. So how far away is the sun? Over the last 200 years, those who believe that the earth is a circle have routinely calculated the distance of the sun from the surface of the earth as being between 3,000 and 6,000 miles away. Between 3,000 and 6,000 miles away. That is straight up above. So I'm going to submit to you tonight, not only is the sun not 93 million miles away, but basic geometry tells us it's only a few thousand miles away. You can take the measurements and do the work and uh, making that calculation there, they've come up with approximately 3,000. But when I did the mathematical calculations myself, I came up with a little bit more than that, but less than 4,000. Here's another calculation someone made using the angles of the sun's rays, and they came up with about 4,000 miles away. But how high is the International Space Station? I mean, isn't it way up there in the outer space also? NASA, their website, says that the International Space Station orbits Earth at an average altitude of approximately 250 miles from the Earth. Now, I bet you thought that the International Space Station was thousands of miles out in outer space circling the Earth. That's not what it is. It's about 250 miles up. That's as high as it goes. That's by NASA's own website. The farthest from Earth that astronauts are traveling from the surface of the Earth is only 250 miles. Even if one chooses to believe the entity which has lied more than any other government agency in history, that's NASA, of course. And we talked over the last few weeks about some of the many lies of NASA You've seen some pictures for yourself. You've heard some of their own words for themselves. Last week or the week before that, you heard in their own astronauts' words in videos them saying they've never been through the Van Allen radiation belt, uh, which, uh, and that they're trying to figure out how to get through the Van Allen radiation belts, and yet supposedly they did that about 60 years ago a handful of times and came back through them. But they're saying today they can't figure out how to get through them. NASA has never been thousands of miles away from the Earth. By their own admission, the furthest they're away from the Earth is 250 miles with the International Space Station. You say, well, how high up is 250 miles, though? Let me give you some kind of perspective. A basketball. A basketball is approximately, now, Timothy, I looked this up to make sure I had it right. Uh, an official NBA basketball is approximately nine and a half inches in diameter. Uh, the diameter of the Earth, according to NASA, is about 8,000 miles. So the International Space Station, being 250 miles up, 
If the basketball represents the earth, that means the International Space Station is only one quarter of an inch above the surface of the basketball. That's how far away from the earth the International Space Station is. It's not this much away from the basketball. It's not that far away from the basketball. If here's the basketball, it's that far away from the basketball. NASA is not in outer space. They're 250 miles from the Earth by their own admission. Not very far indeed for an agency that claims it is exploring space and has been to the moon and back numerous times in the 60s and 70s. They have trouble uh, tripping over their own words. Modern science says the sun, the moon, and the stars are millions of miles away. But the Bible says all of the heavenly bodies are above the earth in an enclosed space beneath the firmament. There is no outer space. You say, preacher, are you saying tonight there is no outer space? Uh, your pastor is telling you tonight there is no outer space. It is a lie that's been made up so that you think you're insignificant, the earth is insignificant, and sometime in the very near future, I assure you, they're going to tell you that aliens are coming to earth or have contacted earth. They're setting the stage for the Antichrist to come on the scene. They're not going to be aliens that are contacting the earth. They're going to be demons, fallen angels. And as we get closer and closer to the last days, any talk you hear about aliens isn't going to have anything to do with aliens. There is no outer space. It's something they have had to create for the big lie that's coming on the horizon. Here's what Genesis chapter 1 says. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Remember, God created the heaven and the earth on day one. It wasn't until day four that He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. So the earth was not spun off of the sun. The moon... Uh, and the stars and the sun were all created on their own on day four after the earth had already been created. You either believe the Bible or you don't. If we say we believe the Bible literally the way it's written, modern science is lying. And there's a reason they're lying. It's because they do not want you to believe in God and they want you to question your Bible. They want everyone to question their Bible. There is no outer space. Modern science says outside of Earth's atmosphere is the emptiness of the vacuum of space which extends infinitely in every direction. In this vast sea of outer space, we find the sun, moon, stars, and planets, some of which are millions of light years away. The Earth is just a speck in the universe, nothing special. Earth is an insignificant planet in an insignificant solar system of an insignificant star, the sun, on the outskirts of an insignificant galaxy called the Milky Way. There's nothing special about Earth and therefore nothing special about you. This is called the Copernican Principle. It's the same lie they want you to believe whether you're talking about the Big Bang in outer space or evolution from monkeys right here on earth. You're just an accident, and so is the earth. It's just the way the devil would like you to believe. You're nothing special, but you are. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the ranch. What you're going to see here in this and the next several slides are the words of actual astrophysicists, astronomers, scientists today and from the 20th century. Some of the biggest named scientists there have been for the last hundred years. You're going to see in their own words that they are admitting that none of what they have observed 
proves their theory of the earth spinning, the earth uh, revolving around the sun, or outer space even existing the way they've told me and you it exists. Let's see it in their own words. While the high priests of Illuminism, those worshiping the sun, are busy writing science books to indoctrinate our children to believe that the earth is a spinning ball orbiting the sun and that there's nothing special about earth or about them, they're admitting something quite different amongst themselves. Here's George Ellis, a cosmologist who was quoted in the 1995 edition of Scientific American, which is a scientific publication. He said, people need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. He's talking about outer space. Not just the, the model that they're pushing on people, but he's saying there are other models that could explain things too. He said, for instance, I can construct you a spherically symmetrical universe with earth at the center and you cannot disprove it based on observations. Wait a minute, I thought the earth wasn't at the center of the universe. I thought that it was just an insignificant galaxy on the outskirts over here somewhere. This is one of their biggest scientists admitting the data we have, the observations we have, doesn't prove uh, what we've been saying because I can take the same data and prove to you that the earth is at the center of everything. He said you can only exclude the earth being at the center on philosophical grounds. We are using philosophical criteria in choosing our models. You hear what he just said? He just said, listen, it's not the data that says the earth isn't at the center. It's that we don't choose to believe the earth is at the center. That's a scientist telling you that. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't science, true science, isn't it supposed to just go by the facts? That's what Paul calls science falsely so-called in the New Testament. This is not science at all. It's pseudoscience. He also said down here in 1978, this assumption is made because it is believed to be re unreasonable that we should be near the center of the universe. He said, we, we say that the earth is not the center of the universe because to us as scientists it seems unreasonable that the earth ought to be in the center of everything. All they had to do was read that book and know that the earth is the center of all of God's creation. I'm not going to read all of these, but look at the parts I've put in bold. This is James Coleman, who's a well-known physicist. He said, uh, the idea that the earth might be stationary, not moving, he said, such an idea was not considered seriously since it would mean, in effect, that our earth occupied the omnipotent position in the universe. He said, in spite of the Michelson-Morley experiment that we looked at about four weeks ago, he said we decided no matter what the experiment showed, we're not going to go with that. We're not going to tell everybody that. We're not going to put that in the science books because we are not going to consider it seriously, even though that's what the experiment proved every time they did the experiment, that the earth was stationary and not moving. The next one, physicist Stephen Hawking. He's the handicapped uh, scientist passed away. who who passed into, who yeah. just recently passed away, but an avowed atheist, very anti-God. Look what he says. We have no scientific evidence for or against this assumption that the universe uh, is not centered around the earth. He said, we believe it only on grounds of modesty. He said, we, he said, the data doesn't show that the earth isn't the center. We just know it can't be that way, so we don't believe it's that way. Philosophy. Philosophy. We'll come back to that, Brother Mike. Uh, Edwin Hubble, for whom the Hubble telescope is named, um, in 1937, this published uh, article by him, uh, he's talking again about the concept of the earth being at the center of the universe. He says this hypothesis cannot be disproved. The unwelcome position of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. Such a favored position is intolerable. 
You know why Edwin Hubble said that the idea that the earth being at the center of the universe is intolerable and that it cannot be considered? It's because if the earth is at the center, then the word of God is true. There's a God that put it at the center. It's important. And we're all accountable to the God that put us at the center. That's one of the biggest names. Albert Einstein, down here at the bottom, again, talking about whether the Ptolemaic system or the Copernican system, which one is true? Is the earth at the center or is the sun at the center of the solar system? He said either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. That's Albert Einstein. If you weren't here about four weeks ago when we looked at how he, why he came up with the special theory of relativity... He created it just to try to explain away the fact that all the experiments showed that the earth is not moving at all. And he was the one they brought in to try to explain it all the way, uh, explain it all the way. So he came up with the gobbledygook equations he came up with that have no relation to reality. Kepler, he's the one that said that the earth goes in elliptical orbits around the sun instead of uh, uh, circles around the sun. He said, I demonstrate... Did he say by science? No. Did he say by mathematics? No. He said, I demonstrate by means of philosophy that the earth is round and is inhabited on all sides, that it is insignificantly small and is born or carried through the stars, moving through the stars. He said he proved that through philosophy. He didn't use math. He didn't use science. He didn't use astronomy. He admits to us by philosophy he's proved what he's proved. Now, I don't know about where you come from, but your philosophy is only about as valuable as my philosophy. And if there's nothing more backing it up than your philosophy, there's not a whole lot of science to that. That's pseudoscience. You believe that God created everything, that it didn't evolve. You're accused of pseudoscience. They're the ones practicing pseudoscience, not you and I. Uh, Look what Edwin Hubble again said in 1937. The observations as they stand lead to the anomaly of a closed universe, curiously small and dense, and it may be added, suspiciously young. He just said that the earth, that's a circle, enclosed with the firmament, is close and dense and relatively young. And that's what the observations show. But he doesn't believe that, or didn't believe that before he died. And none of the other talking heads. Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't believe that, but that's what the observations show, that what the Bible describes is true. This fella, Varshney, says the earth is the center of the universe based upon the the red shift of quasars they've looked at through telescopes. And I won't read all of that, but he says the cosmological principle known as the Copernican system, is going to have to go. It just doesn't fit with what we've observed. He says, both the special and general theory of relativity must be abandoned. Why? Because nothing substantiates the theories. They're all made up. Another physicist, Richard Wolfson, says, uh, if the earth isn't moving relative to the ether, then earth alone among the cosmos is at rest. That is not moving. Everything else is moving. He says, now that might be an absurd possibility, but maybe it's true. Why is he saying maybe it's true when he doesn't want it to be true? Because all the evidence suggests it's true. The earth isn't moving. We looked at more than a dozen verses several weeks ago where the Bible says the earth is at rest, it moves not. But modern science has to have the earth move. 
has to have it inconsequential in order for Satan to pull off the big lie. Albert Einstein, again, speaking in Japan, said in 1922, I have come to believe the motion of the earth cannot be detected by any experiment, though the earth is revolving around the sun. Wait a minute. You can't prove the earth is moving, but it's moving. Sounds real scientific, doesn't it? Albert Einstein, we spent quite a while talking about him again about four weeks ago. He was an atheist, Jewish, socialist, Marxist, did not believe in God, hated God, hated the Bible. I showed you some of his own quotes about God in the Bible. He thought God is a fairy tale and the Bible is something even worse. Uh, Michael Rowan Robinson, astronomer and physicist, says, It is evident that, the, uh, that in the post-Copernican era of human history, where we live now, no well-informed and rational person can imagine that the earth occupies a unique position in the universe. He says, no well-informed and rational person, and yet all of the evidence of all the experiments that his crowd have been performing say the earth is at rest and in the center. Uh, Marcus Chown, uh, New Scientist Magazine, 2008, if we are in a void answering how we came to be in such a privileged spot in the middle of the universe would be even trickier. So why do they continue with the lies? Because it's what their religion says it has to be, not what the observable facts say. I'm almost through. This is our last slide on quotes here. Uh, Jonathan Katz in The Biggest Bangs, The Mystery of Gamma Rays, blah, 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 says, uh, um, the, that space is a sphere or spherical shell with us at the center. Richard Wolfson, again, a physicist, says, do you really want to return to parochial pre-Copernican ideas? He says, if the, if the earth is not moving and it's at the center, we're going back to the way things were before the modern era Parochial, that means Christian, pre-Copernican ideas. He said, we don't want to go back to those Christian ideas. We don't want to go back to the Bible being the standard. We want to stick with modern science. So even though all the evidence suggests that that was right, we're not going back to that because we don't want the consequences that come with that being right. And finally... So there it is, in their own words. The scientists themselves admitting that the evidence demonstrates their model of the universe is untrue and that the biblical model is true. Folks, those were the biggest names in cosmology for the last hundred years that you just heard quoted. But they cannot and will not accept it. It is unacceptable and must be refused no matter what. It's a stronghold. These are the truths that they know but will never say publicly on radio or television or in the classroom because their entire religion of atheism, evolution, and sun worship would come crashing down. Instead, their theories, which are all either unproven or have been disproven, are the only ones allowed to be taught in schools. And anyone who dares to say publicly what they have said privately is called a nut, a fruitcake backwards and ignorant. That's what they call us for saying these things in the open, but they say them behind closed doors when they're talking among themselves because they know what the science proves. They know the Bible's correct, but they will not accept it because it means that the God of the Bible is real and that they must be accountable to Him. And they are accountable to Him. So let's talk about the vacuum of space. Now, I'm just going to tell you, the rest of tonight, we're talking about outer space. If you believed what modern science says about the model around the Earth going into space, they say that just above Earth's atmosphere is a total vacuum of space. I mean, we've all heard the stories, what would happen to an astronaut if he was uh, out there and he got a, a hole, even a pinhole in his... Uh, 
I was fixing to say costume, in his <laughs> space suit, uh, Freudian slip, sorry. Uh, even if he got just a small hole, he would, he would uh, implode rather than explode because of the vacuum of space. Um, that if there was even the tiniest tear in the space, uh, in, in International Space Station or the space capsule on their way to and back from the moon, it would immediately, the entire thing would implode because of the vacuum of space. But wait a minute. Let's think for just a second. This is one of the ways that you can know without having any science degree at all that their entire model is a lie. They say that here's the earth, here's the earth's atmosphere, and just past the earth's atmosphere is a total vacuum. Now, what happens when you put anything next to a vacuum? It sucks it all away. If the earth's atmosphere was next to the vacuum of space, the earth's atmosphere wouldn't stay here. It would be sucked away also. We have been told for decades that space is a vacuum. After all, that's one of the reasons that the astro I call them astronauts. Astronauts must have pressurized space, space suits and ride in a pressurized cabin, right? Except that it violates numerous laws of physics that they teach. Number one, Earth's atmosphere would be sucked out into space to fill the vacuum. A vacuum, listen, a vacuum cannot exist next to a non-vacuum without immediately sucking the contents from the non-vacuum. Such a phenomenon as we're told, to, we told exists with a vacuum of space adjacent to our atmosphere cannot be recreated in any experiment because it is a physical impossibility. They cannot create any scenario in a laboratory or out there anywhere where there's something next to a vacuum and the something doesn't get sucked into the vacuum as soon as the barrier is pulled down between them. Second problem they have. Light waves could not travel through space if it were a vacuum. Waves must have a medium through which to travel, such as water, air, or wires. Light waves don't travel through a vacuum. They can only travel through some medium. Air, water, wires. It has to go have something for the wave to be carried. If it's a vacuum of space, there's nothing for the light waves to, to be carried on. Same thing with radio waves. Radio waves could not travel through space if it were a vacuum. Waves must have a medium through which to travel. Finally, rocket engines. Rocket engines could not move a rocket through space if it were a vacuum. Now, I put a picture up here of uh, Battlestar Galactica. I don't know, maybe your favorite was Star Trek or Star Wars or something when I was a boy growing up. Buck Rogers and Battlestar Galactica were all the rage when I was a boy. And uh, I love thinking about the, the spaceships uh, when they hit the booster rockets going through space. Rocket engines could not move a rocket through space if there was actually a vacuum of outer space. Rocket engines move vehicles by providing thrust, which must have something such as air against which to push to pro propel the vehicle forward. Again, in a vacuum, there is nothing to push against. So all this stuff about their rocket engines going through space and coming back, and Elon and all of his uh, fancy CGI uh, computer-drawn videos of rockets going and coming, folks, none of that is possible in a vacuum because the, thrust, the, the rocket would have nothing for the thrust to push against to move it in an absolute vacuum like they say is space. Rockets in space. Both NASA and Hollywood want us to believe that rocket ships powered by powerful thrusters are able to travel through space. The only problem with that is that it's impossible because there's nothing for them to push against. 
Sorry, didn't mean to ruin it for the Star Wars and Buck Rogers fans. Watch what happens in this video in a near vacuum with only slight atmospheric pressure. Okay, now I'm about to show the first video for tonight. And uh, this little container is not a true vacuum. They can't make it a 100% vacuum, but it's going to be a, a closer than normal uh, situation to being a vacuum. They're using something literally to pump the air out and try to get as close to creating a vacuum as they can create. So fly. So I have a little magnet in here where I can go get them and try to make them fly. Okay, can flies fly in a vacuum chamber? Three, two, one. Okay, we're at 0.8 atmospheres. We're still flying. 0.6 atmospheres. Still flying. Half an atmosphere. They're having a harder time flying. They keep landing, falling onto the ground. Okay, we're at 0.4 atmospheres. They keep falling to the ground. <laughs> yep, they can't fly. There's one more up here. So we're at 0.2 atmospheres. Let me pause it right there. 0.2 atmospheres. See how they just fall to the ground? There's one right here. <laughs> so this isn't even a full vacuum. Okay, let me get it down a little more. <laughs> they can't fly. Okay, we're up, we're only at 0.1 atmospheres, not full vacuum, but they can't get <laughs> they definitely can't fly. Okay, I'm gonna stop it for time's sake, but the point is, you see, the closer you get to a true vacuum, nothing can fly because there's nothing to push against. There's no air to push against. It wouldn't matter if they had a rocket attached to the back of the fly. It wouldn't be able to fly because there's nothing to push against. Now, in that little box, you might could because it would ultimately be pushing against the side of the container, but in outer space, if it's a true vacuum like scientists say it is, Rocket ships couldn't even travel through outer space if it's a vacuum because there's nothing to push against in a vacuum. Aerodynamics wouldn't mean much either. That's exactly right, wouldn't it? Wings, tail fins, none of that. Wouldn't have any effect on anything. You're exactly right. Ingenuity is the name of the helicopter attachment of the supposed Mars rover during the 2020 Mars mission. Despite NASA speculating that Mars has less than 1% of Earth's atmospheric pressure, NASA reports that Ingenuity is off and flying around Mars, sending back pictures of the red planet. Now, three weeks ago, I showed a video with, uh, with employees of NASA telling you how they create the videos and the pictures that NASA shows the public. The hint is, if you weren't here to see that, None of that is actually coming from outer space. It's their artistic renderings of what they believe it looks like. None of it is actual pictures coming back from Mars, no matter what they might want you to believe. Ingenuity weighs four pounds, and its propeller, propeller length measures four feet. It's supposedly solar-powered and was built by JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, that we're going to talk about next week for a modest $80 million. What a yeah, they, they bought this little thing that's worth less than $100 and paid $80 million for it. Uh, Brother Danny, we're in the wrong business. Uh, by the way, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that was bought by NASA as one of their conglomerate uh, companies way back at the beginning of NASA in the 1950s, is the founder of JPL was a known occultist, Satanist, Jack Parsons. We're going to talk about him more next week, so make sure you're here uh, for that next week.
Now, I had another video to show you what propellers do in a near vacuum, but it's the same thing as the flies. It can't fly. There's nothing to push against. Uh, we're not going to watch that for time's sake tonight. What about radio and television waves in space? Just like engines could not work in space because there's nothing against which to push, so too could radio, television, nor even light rays travel through the vacuum of space, if it's what they say it is, since all waves must have some medium through which to travel. The reality is that there is no such thing as outer space, and there is no such thing as a vacuum out there somewhere away from the earth. This is mere, there's merely a less dense atmosphere the higher from earth you get and the closer to the firmament. Houston, we have a problem. There, there is no outer space. I, I hope what you're getting is the understanding that what they're telling you there is out there isn't out there. They've got to get all of us to believe their lie for the big lie that's still yet to come. It's all a lie. It's all to get you to disbelieve that book. There is no such thing as outer space. Even their own theories don't hold up if you believe what they say is out there. Albert Einstein, again, we saw his quote. He said, either coordinate system, either with the earth in the center of the universe or something else in the center of the universe could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions. He said, everything that we observe works just as well on paper if the earth is at the center and not moving as if the sun is at the center and not moving. Even after accepting geocentrism, the earth being at the center, I couldn't wrap my head, though, around, uh, around the idea that everything else in the universe could revolve around the earth every 24 hours. All right, so you can not read that and just look here for a second. When I came to the point several years ago that I just decided to believe the Bible literally the way it's written, that the earth is at the center, it does not move. The Bible says over and over the earth does not move. When I accepted that, the the thing I couldn't wrap my mind around is, okay, well, if the earth isn't spinning, then everything up there is going around the earth every 24 hours because we can observe it happen in the night sky every 24 hours. So I'm thinking if the sun's 93 million miles away and it's the closest star to the earth, those stars that are millions and billions and trillions of miles away how could they possibly be going fast enough to go around the earth, above the earth, every 24 hours? That was too much to wrap my mind around until I just accepted what the Bible says about the firmament being up above and everything that's up there is in the firmament. Everything is not billions and trillions of miles away. It's not millions of miles away. It's all a whole lot closer. And the things that are up there are not what you and I have been told they are. What do we know about the moon? We really have no way to know exactly what the moon is. I will tell you it's not what they say that it is. Uh, the, it's doubtful that there's anything up there that's a solid anything that you could land on. The Bible says that the moon is one of two great lights in the sky. If it's one of two great lights in the sky, then it's not what they have told us it is. It's not what modern science says it is. Modern science says the moon is not a light, but a reflector of the sun's light. That's not what the Bible says. We read the verses in Genesis that say... There are two great lights in the sky. One's the sun, and the lesser one is the moon. It is a light. We talked five weeks ago about the difference between sunlight and moonlight. Moonlight is not hot, warm, like sunlight. 
And if it was the reflection of sunlight, it would have the same properties as sunlight. It's not. Moonlight is cold rather than warm. And we talked about some of the other differences between sunlight and moonlight. One of the things we do know is that the moon is not a reflector of the sun. It's a light up there in the sky. Whatever it is, it's a light in the sky. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. What else do we know about the moon? There's a lot we don't know about the moon. There's more we don't know about it than what we do know about it. We also know that the blue of the heavens can be seen through it during the daylight when it's not a full moon. And that even stars appear to sometimes be visible through the moon when it's not full. So then it would seem that whatever the moon is, it has characteristics of transparency. There are times in the night sky when it's a partial moon, like you see pictured here, where you can see stars where there should be a moon there somewhere in the background. How could that be if the moon was what they've told us it is? Firm ground like you and I walk on down here. The moon is not the same as the earth. It's a light in the sky, just like the Bible says. This is a video that talks about the moon and its phases during a lunar eclipse. I'm not going to play the video for time's sake tonight. I'll send it to you if you want to see it later in the week on your own. But the, the point of the video is that they say that, the, that lunar eclipses occur when the earth comes between the sun and the moon. And the earth's shadow is what causes the eclipse on the moon. However, there are many times recorded in history, even in the last few years, when the sun and the moon are both visible from earth in the sky above the horizon. Now, if both the sun and the moon are visible above the horizon here on earth, then we're not in the middle of the two. So what they're saying, the sun and the moon are, And what causes the eclipse, it is not the way that it is. Even following their logic, things just don't add up. There are also times that uh, the part of the moon that seems to appear in the sky, it's not directly across from where the sun is shining. So that if it was a reflection of the sun's light, this part of the moon should be what we see up in the sky, not this part of the phase of the moon. So there are so many things that don't add up. Their explanation for the moon being a reflection of the sunlight (coughs) is not in keeping with the Bible, and it's not even in keeping with uh, things that you and I can observe with our own eyesight. Mm. Number two, during the lunar eclipse. Finally, we know that the gravity of the moon does not cause the tides in spite of what modern science would have us to believe. Otherwise, the water in ponds and lakes would also experience tides, when in fact, they don't. What causes the tides? There are some people out there that believe the Bible that have speculated about some things, about the fountains of the deep that the Bible talks about during the flood, uh, underneath the oceans, maybe causing the tides. But whatever causes them, I can tell you for sure, the moon isn't what's causing them. Otherwise, it'd be causing tides in every body of water that was standing on the earth as well. All right, so here's the best part of the whole study, the part we're going to finish up with tonight. What are stars? Now, I know what you and I have been told stars are, but that's not what the Bible says stars are. And if you believe your Bible, by the time I finish in the next few minutes, you're not going to believe anything modern science has to say from this point on. Modern science would have us to believe that each star is a huge ball of burning gas like they claim the sun is, and that each star has its own solar system with planets, moons, etc. But what does the Bible say about stars? Genesis 1, 14 through 19, we read the verses already. I'm not going to reread the verses, but here's summarized what it tells us. Number one, They were created on day four with the sun and the moon. Number two, 
They are not one of the two great lights, which include the sun and the moon. Wait a minute. I thought stars were the same as the sun. The Bible doesn't say they're the same as the sun. The Bible doesn't say the sun is a star. Science says our sun is a star. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says stars are something totally different and that they are not one of the two great lights. They're lights, but they're not one of the two great lights. So if they're not one of the two great lights, that means they're lesser than the sun and the moon, not greater than the sun and the moon. Number three, it says that they, just like the sun and the moon, are located inside the firmament. It says God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So they're inside the firmament. They're not way out there in outer space somewhere. They're in the firmament. We looked at what the Bible calls the firmament in very detailed study last week. My favorite study of the whole series. Here's a passage in Revelation that talks about stars falling to the earth. Look what it says. Revelation 6 says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now folks, I'm going to tell you, if stars are what Neil deGrasse Tyson say they are, and what NASA says they are, there's no way they're falling to the earth. The earth wouldn't survive the impact of one star, let alone all the stars of heaven falling to the earth. Now folks, if you believe that the book of Revelation is real... It's literal. The stars falling to earth right there prove to you that they're not what we've been told they are. They're not these huge balls of gas that are going to come converging upon the earth. As one fellow said, if that were the case, we'd have a lot bigger problem than the Antichrist and whatever he was doing here on the earth if a star was headed towards the earth. Isaiah records the same future event in Isaiah 34. Jesus said the exact same thing in Mark 13. The sun becomes black and the moon becomes as blood, which is the fulfillment of Joel 2. Number two, the firmament rolls up like a scroll. We talked about that last week. The firmament can't just be an expanse of space because it couldn't roll up if that's all it was was space. A firmament, in order to roll up, has to be some material thing. Number three, the lost of the earth seek to hide from the Lamb of God who they can apparently see sitting on the throne above once the firmament rolls up. And number four, the stars fall to the earth. So then what are stars? Now I am going to show you this short video because it shows what stars actually look like through a telescope, a high-powered telescope. They don't look anything like what you and I have been told they look like. This video is only about 30 seconds. This is what stars actually look like through a high-powered telescope. All right, clues about the nature of stars. These are all verses out of the Bible about stars. Don't don't go off and daydream for a minute. Look at what the Bible says about stars. Judges 5.20 says, They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Who was Sisera? He was a a Syrian captain. He was a, a general. It says the stars in their courses fought against that general from Syria. Uh, Job 38, 6 and 7, Who laid the cornerstone thereof? The earth. When the morning stars sang together 
and all the sons of God shouted for glory. Psalm 147, He telleth the number of the stars, He calleth them all by their names. Daniel 8, And if the little horn wax, and it, the little horn wax great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Mark chapter 13, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the heavens shaken, we just read this, the stars of heaven shall fall. 1 Corinthians 15, there's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth, in, uh, differeth from another star in glory. Jude 13, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Why would God reserve the blackness of darkness forever for stars? They don't, stars don't deserve judgment, they're stars. Revelation 1, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the churches of the seven churches. Revelation 6, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Revelation 12, and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. The Bible talks a lot about stars, but it doesn't seem at all to be describing what NASA is describing as stars. Here's a summary of what the Bible said about stars in those verses we just read. Number one, they fought for Israel. Number two, they sang. Number three, they all have names and God knows the name of each star. Number four, they're synonymous in the Bible with the host of heaven. And by the way, the word translated host means army. Number five, they fall to the earth. Number six, their glory is different than the sun and the moon, and they differ from each other. Number seven, some stars wander and have the blackness of darkness reserved for them forever. Number eight, Stars represent the angels of the seven churches in Revelation. Number nine, the great red dragon's tail drew one-third of them and cast them to the earth in the book of Revelation. What do stars sound like to you after reading all of these clues from the Bible? Do they sound like that burning ball of gas that looks like the sun 93 million miles away like NASA has described? Is that what a star is according to the Bible? I don't think so. What does it sound to you like a star is? Angels, angels. demons. Angels, fall, both, both fallen angels and not fallen angels is what it sounds like uh, according to the Bible. Stars are not described in Scripture as being some huge ball of burning gas millions of miles away. They're described as being lights in the firmament and being angels that are lights in the firmament. Preacher, I, I just I don't believe what you're saying. Well, all I'm doing is showing you what the Bible says. You can do with it whatever you want to do with it, but that's what the Bible says. Now, there's a passage in the book of Ezekiel that talks about the wheels of Ezekiel. The wheels of Ezekiel, it's a vision that Ezekiel the prophet had in the Old Testament. The vision that he had seems now to make more sense to me than it ever did before. When you hear the words of Ezekiel and how he describes what he saw, you're about to see some more of those high-resolution images through a telescope of stars at the same time that you hear the words of Ezekiel and the wheel that he saw. I think you're going to find this interesting. It's about seven minutes long. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to play the whole thing if I can pull it up here. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work 
was like unto the color of a beryl, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The second type of angel described in Ezekiel 1 is even more bizarre. Meet the Ophanim. According to Medium, Ophanim comes from the Hebrew word for wheels. It's a fitting name because Ezekiel's vision suggests that some of God's angels are actually floating eye-covered wheels that sparkle like jewels. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. The likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two which covered on this side, and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it. 
From the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a beryl, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So you saw through a high-powered telescope what stars look like. You heard the description that Ezekiel gave of the creatures that he saw in a wheel within a wheel. Certainly sounds like Ezekiel was describing what we see as stars through a telescope, but he says they were living creatures. They were a type of angel. So the last thing we're left with after stars is what about the planets? The only verse in the English Bible that contains the word planet or planets is 2 Kings 23 verse 5. It says, And he put down the idolatrous priests who the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal to the sun to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. In other words, they were worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars as part of their worship of Baal, the false god. Nice. The Hebrew word here is nazal, nazal, which literally means to stream, flow, pour, or drop. That's a word for planets. So why would the English translators translate it as planets in this verse? All of the ancient cultures who studied the heavens identified certain stars that moved in the heavens besides simply rotating around the earth every day like the other stars. In other words, they saw some stars up there that every 24 hours, they're not just going around the earth 365 days a year the same way. Some of them move in other ways than just going around the earth. Those are the ones that ancient civilizations, not just the ancient Hebrews, but others, they referred to them as wandering stars. The Greek word planetes, for example, means wanderer. That's where we get the word planet. It simply means a wandering star. It's a star. It's not something different. It's not a ball like they say the earth is. It's nothing with terra firma on it. It's just a star that moves out of a regular course. Consider Jude 1.13 that says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Here the word translated wandering is planetes, and the word translated star is astare, literally means wandering stars, just as the translators of our King James Bible rendered it. So the Bible says those stars up there that don't stay in their normal circuit, that move out of places, God's not happy with them. 
and God has reserved special judgment for wandering stars. Isn't it interesting that the wandering stars that we call planets are the stars that most often have been worshipped throughout human history? Why do you reckon that is that they are worshipped by unsaved mankind? It's because they are angelic beings and they're, they're some of the ones that are in rebellion to God. They are the Saturn, the Neptune, the Jupiter, the Venus, the Mars. Those are the names of the gods of those that are lost all the way back to ancient civilizations. They are worshiping fallen angels in worshiping the planets. Those wandering stars up there, they're angelic beings. And that's why they are being worshipped by the lost. The Bible regards the planets as stars that move out of sync with the rest of the stars, not as other places with terra firma like our earth. The notion that they're places where somebody could land, walk, live is purely a creation of modern science and Jules Verne along with the rest of them. Also note that the book of Jude does say one other interesting thing about these wandering stars. Their judgment is the blackness of darkness Forever. Why would God judge stars? Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for who? The yeah. devil and his angels. Hell is prepared for his angels. Here's a picture, for example, of the planet Pluto. These are all pictures from NASA. These are the official NASA pictures of Pluto, the planet Pluto. That's the picture NASA produced in 1996 of the planet Pluto. That's 2005. These are official NASA photos. Here's their 2015. Is it the <laughs> planet or a Disney character? Remember how I told you that the begin at the beginning of NASA when it was created, it was working in close connection with Walt Disney. We're going to talk more about that next week in the final presentation of Biblical Cosmology. It's all been a production to deceive the world. Walt Disney, Hollywood, they're all, it's all been used by Satan to create this image of a universe that is not real. That's what NASA currently says is the planet Pluto. There's the dog Pluto. They're laughing at us. They are laughing at us. They have deceived us, and they don't mind even sticking, our, sticking their thumb in our eye as they laugh at us. There's another video I'm not going to show about the International Space Station and them doing a spacewalk outside the International Space Station, you see bubbles moving uh, through, the sp through space. There are no bubbles in space. They're filming it in underwater tanks. I, we, we're not going to watch that. We don't have time to do that tonight. The final slide. Worshiping wandering stars. Jude one thirteen says that they worship wandering stars. Also note the Bible says that uh, they're reserved in judgment. The ancient pagan cultures named the wandering stars that they could see with the naked eye and worship them as deities. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and all the rest. The children of Israel were warned of God about worshiping the stars in Deuteronomy. Worship them and serve them, the hosts of heaven. Jeremiah 8, 2. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon, all the hosts of heaven whom they have loved and whom they have served, and after whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. And New Testament Christians are warned of the very same thing in Colossians 2.18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels. A worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars has been part of occult pagan worship since Nimrod and the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And it has continued under the myriad of versions which make up Mystery Babylon today in setting up 
the stage for the coming tribulation and the Antichrist. NASA is a part of it. The whole lie of outer space is a part of this big lie. Now next week, I'm going to finish up with a why would they even have why would they even lie about this and who are some of the the players in all of this the big liar. <laughs> and then I'm going to conclude with all right what do I do with this knowledge I want to tell you again I don't recommend you just going out and telling everybody what you've learned until we talk next week and let me give you my suggestions about how to present the truth to people that might not know it because I'm going to be honest with you Seven, eight weeks ago, you probably didn't know any of this either. It's probably been extremely eye-opening in some ways to you. Some of the different things we've seen right out of the Bible and how science confirms the Bible. But the average person, they're just like you and I. They've been lied to their whole lives. It's going to be a big, big bite. If you just try to tell them the truth all at one sitting, you've gotten it bits and pieces over the last eight weeks, seven weeks. I want to give you my best suggestions next week on how to present this if, if you have someone you, you want to present the truth to. We ought not be bashful about talking about the truth. I'm going to be honest with you. I, you know, I knew very well coming into this study, this would be potentially the most controversial Bible study I've ever done. But it's all based on the Bible. Whatever you want to do with it is up to you. But I'll tell you, my relationship with God, after just deciding to accept the Bible literally for the way it's written, my relationship with Him is totally different than it was three years ago when I just decided to believe this. You say, preacher, you believe this for the last three years? Yep, I sure have. Well, preacher, we didn't know it. It, it hasn't uh, affected the way you've done any of our Bible studies, the way you've taught, no. But my relationship with him is different. Everything in that book is true. All of science that disagrees with that book is just a lie. That book is true. All right, I promised I would take questions and comments at the end before we leave. So is there anybody has a question or a comment about anything we've talked about tonight or up to this point before we leave tonight?